Hello everyone, I'm audible, right? It's clear, the voice. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks for joining in today. I'm Prashant Sakul Shreshta and today we are going to talk about observability in this session, in particular end-to-end -end observability. And I work as a software engineer at Postman. For those who may not know, Postman is this API platform where you can design, develop and build and test your APIs and share them publicly and uh, yeah, within your team as well. So I work in the reliability team of Postman and whatever I'm about to discuss today in this session is sort of related to my experiences in the reliability team. So yeah, so let's just begin. Uh, if we just look at a glance, then in this session we'll discuss about what observability is, what end-to-end -end observability is, where it fits, where it doesn't, uh, what are the pitfalls and how we can overcome them. I'll be sharing my own experiences as well and uh, like uh, towards the end there's a small demo as well. I'll be sharing some references too. So I hope you really enjoy it. So without wasting any more time, let's just dive in. Okay. So the first point of interest should be understanding observability. So why is there such a hype around this term, observability? So with this session, we'll try to like understand all that and uh, for like making it easy for us, we are going to uh, take this up in the format and the order that's stated. Why, what, where and how. So cool, let's begin. As Simon Sinek says, start with why. So we are gonna do the same. We will be asking ourselves, why do we need observability? So if you like take a look at this slide, this particular diagram, uh, it talks about development on one single machine. It could be your local system right here, this laptop. So all the code, all the configurations are in this one system and there's just one developer. So if suppose I'm writing the code, mm -hmm. I have complete context about it. And if there's any bug, any sort of failure, I would know where to look and how to fix it. So in a flash, I can like make my application come back running again. It's sort of manageable and we can say like it's a golden scenario, not very real. So gradually, let's just move towards practicality now. Um, this is a much bigger scenario than what we just saw. So there's a team of individuals and the application is also more complex. We can see that like it has multiple services, but um, it's like everything's present in one machine, a monolith. So still like the context is central within the team and things would be manageable. Uh, like a bit worse than our previous situation, but still we can say it's manageable. Uh, but now if you look here, like this is what a microservice architecture usually looks like and it's widely adopted in the industry as well. So here uh, there are like multiple services running in different instances. They are interacting with different databases. They are interacting with each other and a lot of teams are there. They're, so different teams manage different services and uh, the mesh is really like complex and uh, as your business grows, you'll add more features and uh, this mesh is like bound to become more and more complex. And and this architecture, this microservice architecture, was introduced in the industry like on purpose. We wanted faster deployment times. We wanted less time to reach the market. So we decided to make our teams and our services loosely coupled. And yeah, it brought a lot of advantages, but it came with a like its own set of disadvantages. And if you look like in this diagram, if we say service D goes down for some reason, it blows up. So it's going to take with itself service A, service C, and all the services, those services are calling. And uh, my errors may get propagated to the front end. So my users are now, like, they know that, OK, something's wrong. And uh, in this situation, the, the context is not central. And uh, if you want to find out, like, what's the origin of failure, you want to debug the situation and fix it, it will be really chaotic. And um, in, there are rarely those super engineers, and it's difficult to find them and retain them who know everything about the architecture and who are willing to fix everything. And in my opinion, we should not rely on those super engineers, but instead focus on adding observability to our service meshes so that whenever things blow up, as they are bound to happen, we are able to detect them and fix them faster. So yeah, this could be like a perfectly valid why. If you are a developer or a software engineer like me, you would feel that, okay, I need to uh, have, a f like I need to be uh, fast in triaging, I need to fix my issues faster, and that's a perfectly valid why for me. But if you like take a look at multiple personas and uh, for example, a business leader who's in finance or sales or something like that, then for them it may be like a bit tricky. So let's just ask ourselves multiple levels of 
why so that we come to know like we are like clear about why we need observability so yeah let's just begin that exercise cool so as established we want observability for a better debugging and fixing experience why do we need that so that our engineers get a peaceful night of sleep cool yes we need that that's required so that our engineers are more productive if you are not fighting fires all the time you'll be more productive you'll be less burnt out and that's something we really desire and uh, better like more productive engineers lead to better quality product that leads to a better user experience and yeah with a better ux comes customer satisfaction which we all desire when we are building a business when we are building a product and needless to say all this boils down to business value yeah so it's all about money it's all about reputation and uh, like if you think about it if you have a good product you're going to get customers sure but if it fails often and you take a lot of time in fixing it your customers would be frustrated and uh, like they'll eventually churn out the trust in your product will decrease but consider a reverse scenario where okay you have a product good product it has observability integrated and now you'll be able to detect things faster before they suppose reach to your customers you'll be able to detect them faster and fix them faster and now your customers are getting a more consistent experience so the trust in your product rises and as a result like they'll be satisfied and uh, you'll get new customers and more importantly you'll also retain old ones which is equally important and like when you like uh, just think about it it's like a small client to today could be a bigger even the biggest client tomorrow just because we are thinking about a simple a simple stuff like adding observability to our entire product chain so this should be like our clarification um, we need observability because of the business value it creates and with that firmly established we can now move to the next section that discusses about what is observability okay so there's this amazing definition which comes from control theory um, like uh, mostly people think that observability is monitoring or it's like introduced in the it industry but it's really not also observability is not a tool which you can buy or which you can build it's sort of a concept and we need to understand that concept so that we are able to apply it in our product chain so as per control theory observability is a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from the knowledge of its external outputs cool let's see like diagrammatically because i love diagrams okay so we have a system here it has multiple states working degraded down etc it's sending some sort of signals to an external system if we consider like our it landscape this could be our monitoring system which is like collecting all those signals it's evaluating those things and determining the state and uh, like it can take certain actions on them it could alert uh, it could generate alerts or it could like trigger our self healing systems so if you see this again golden scenario yeah the system is observable but again let's move towards reality like we did earlier now we have multiple systems and they are communicating with each other in multiple ways and the communication broke for some reason one system is down it's not working as expected so in this scenario is our system still observable is all this entire chain still observable so i would say yes but only in case we know about the communication structure we know what systems are interacting with each other and when that interaction fails we get to know about it we get to know the reason behind it so if we just like redefine our definition we can say that at least in terms of it a good observability system should reveal the communication structure between multiple components so that's our final what for observability we can say that external outputs should map to the internal state of a system and we should know about the communication structure so that with that clear we can now move ahead to the where and the how and to like perfectly understand that we should now talk about end to end observability so let's just see what this means um so if you look at this slide 
this is usually what uh, the usual process or the chain looks like when we are developing an application and deploying it. So uh, in the beginning, you have your developers who are coding in multiple IDs, and then they push your, all the changes to a repository. You have your CI CD system where you run your test, and then it builds some images. Uh, it deploys things on the servers, and then finally, your clients are able to reach your servers via a network. So this is the whole process. This is the, like, the whole chain where observability would be required. But to like, simplify it, let's just break it down one by one and see what happens. OK, so level one is the, like, uh, where your developers are coding in multiple IDs. So here you want that your code should be standardized uh, in terms of formatting. It should be consistent. So yeah, there are like things to consider here. So for these things, for these purposes, do we actually need observability? Do we need to collect data about it? So I would say that in order to accomplish all that stuff, a better way would be maybe linting files, some pre-commit hooks, some pre-commit checks. And this particular example I just added to highlight the fact that just because we can collect some data, we can add some observability, we should not do this. There should be a clear purpose behind. And if there are better ways to tackle stuff, we should definitely look for them and like, go ahead with them. So with the first thing checked out, we'll move to the next level. That's our remote repository level. And this is the place where your tests run. So this could be unit tests, some sort of integration test, E2E test, et cetera. And test-driven development is sort of a widely adopted approach now in the industry. And uh, usually people, uh, like in the industry, they generate some test reports and pipe the data to a central system. And the most common thing they try to find is the test coverage, how much of your code base is covered by your tests, which I feel is a really good starting point. But uh, a lot of more useful insights could come from this test data, these test reports. Uh, for example, if suppose your unit runs uh, typically in 5 milliseconds, but after some changes, it started completing in 50 milliseconds. So a 10x change, like 10x increase. So it could indicate there's, there's some trouble with the changes, and you may have to look into that. And that could be a really valuable insight. And flaky tests, we all know about flaky tests, where some test just keeps failing. And if we collect some data about it, we can actually question ourselves, like, is this a poorly written test or a poorly designed component? And all these insights could be valuable for our development and a quality team. So the first level where we should consider adding observability should be here at the test level where we start generating test reports. Cool. Uh, next would be our external systems, the CI, CD system, and image, registr image registry. Um, if you are an application developer, you usually use these systems, but you only care when your build fails. Otherwise, like you do not uh, think much about it. And I guess that should be the case. Uh, the uh, like responsibility of observable, uh, observing these stuff should lie with the team who are like providing these uh, services, either via an external tool or uh, via an in-house solution. And if you are uh, like a part of a team who's handling these sort of services, then whatever we are going to discuss next would apply like equally on these two. So we'd, we would consider that these would be checked again. Cool. So deployed on servers. So with this, we have come to the like most important part of our entire chain, where our code is already deployed on servers. So let's just zoom in on point six a bit. OK. So this is what, uh, after our application is deployed, the structure looks like. You have your application maybe running in multiple containers. Those containers are hosted on certain instances. There could be a load balancer distributing the traffic. Your application could be interacting with a database. And uh, if suppose this is a, this is a client-facing application, your clients could connect to it via a network. So like just from one glance, we can see that there are multiple components involved, and there are multiple connections involved as well. And we would want to add observability in all of these places. So let's just see what all we can do here. At the first level, your application level, you would want to know whether your application is healthy or not, whether it's up or not, and it's able to, like, your users are able to reach it or not. And uh, so yeah, the first level would be the application level. Now your application is hosted on certain containers. 
So you may need some insight about these containers as well. Then those containers are, in, are on some instances. Data needs to be collected at that level as well, because you may want to know about resource utilization. Uh, further, database needs like its own observability. And there are a lot of connections. And as we clearly like established earlier, we need to know about the communication structure. So our application is interacting with the database. It could be interacting with other applications too in the entire ecosystem. So a lot of connections involved, a lot of network involved. And uh, DNS, of, of course, that's involved as well. And you may require DNS level observability for things like DNS lookup time, which you would want to decrease if uh, like, it's giving too much latency inside your network. So if we just look at this, like I've summarized everything here in this list. And uh, a lot of levels of observability is required. And this diagram and this particular list, it kind of confuses us and it's like it feels as if it's too difficult to comprehend and uh, is it even worth it should we even take this much headache for adding observability in our ecosystem our entire purpose was to make it easier for us but if it involves so much complexity is it even worth it so yes it's worth it because yeah it's confusing but we have to simplify it we have to make it simple for ourselves and we owe it to our engineers that we make things more observable for them so let's see how we should, how we can simplify all this stuff down the line. And that we'll do in our next section, that is the how. And uh, in order to understand how we need to like add observability in our systems, we should be clear on our purposes. So in order to do that, we have these lists, like these questions. I mean, first is what is the state of my system? What is not working? Why is it not working? And if something's not working, is the failure or degradation in my system or a dependency? So these are clearly like uh, taken out from the what we established of observability, kind of correlated with that. And we'll try to answer these questions one by one so that we know how we can like add observability in our systems. Okay, metrics, logs, and traces. These are often touted as the three pillars of observability. And I guess no discussion of observability is ever complete without discussing these three. So let's just take a look at them one by one and see what we get. So the first is metrics. So a metric is a measurable value. And we collect these metrics periodically. And these are generally aggregatable. And uh, when we are talking about monitoring, we are generally like talking about these metrics, collecting them in real time, and uh, analyzing them to derive some sort of meaningful information. And then we can visualize this data in whatever format we like, graphs, charts, etc. So the whole notion behind this monitoring is that if we know uh, what normal looks like, if we know how our service responds normally, if we know those values, in case it gets degraded and those values fluctuate or they change, we will be able to detect them, fix them, improve them, etc. So that's the whole reason why we should actually think about monitoring. But what should we consider monitoring? Like there are a lot of data points and a lot of metrics that can be captured, but should we even consider about taking everything in? Is it practical? Um, so I think these golden signals, generally called golden signals, uh, these four metrics, these apply equally to application and infrastructure level components. Uh, the first one would be traffic, which talks about uh, the number of requests your system is uh, uh, handling at a time. So this could be useful when you want to make scaling decisions, perhaps. When, like, under if like the system is under load, you may want to scale up. And uh, suppose you get mis uh, uh, all of a sudden a spike in the traffic, which is mysterious or unexpected. It could be like an indicator that your system is under attack, a DDoS attack, perhaps. Second would be latency. So this means the time taken by a system to respond to a particular client request. So the processing delay and stuff like that. And uh, if you're like, uh, you see an increase in latency, it could mean that there could be a degradation in your system, which you may need to check. If it happens for a prolong prolonged period, then yeah, the system could be degraded for some reason. Third would be error or error rate. Generally, the 4xx and 5xx responses are considered as error rate or failed requests. And we want to like check how many of our requests are failing, because they could indicate that something's failing in our entire system or something's degraded at some level. And uh, error rate could be a good indicator of that. Final one would be saturation, which talks about resource utilization. So 
resources could cons uh, like uh, incorporate things like CPU, memory, network bandwidth, etc. If your resources are overutilized, uh, your client requests could get dropped, they could get timed out, and you would want to know that because your customers may get frustrated at this point of time. And we do not want that to happen. So with these four signals, I feel that we would be able to find the internal state of our system, whether it's failing, it's degraded, whether it's under attack, whether it's overutilized. And in a way, I'm able to know the internal state of my system from the external outputs, which are these signals. So we can say that with monitoring, with the metrics, we'll be able to answer the first question, what is the state of my system? But the rest are still unanswered, so we'll have to move to our next pillar. That is logging. So this is quite common. Uh, while developing applications too, developers add some sort of logs in places where there are known errors. So it will be easy for them to find out what happened and when and where. And uh, usually logs are like activities, activity records which are performed in the system while it's running. They have a timestamp and they have more information on the error and exception. They could have stack traces, etc. So if you want to like go back in time and to a particular event to see why that failure happened, logs could be really helpful there. So these could help in like detecting where the application is failing, why it's failing, what could be the reason behind it. So with logging, we'll be able to answer two more questions. But there's one last question which is still left. And for that, we'll move to our final pillar, which is tracing, quite important one. So a trace records the trail of a client request as it moves through our ecosystem. So it helps in knowing like, uh, if a particular request has like, touched a number of services in your entire ecosystem, a trace would be able to help you like, to find out what that looks like. So in case uh, one of your dependencies is giving inaccurate results or if it's slow, a trace can help you in catching that. It kind of reveals the communication structure and yeah, that's pretty important. Uh, so at every level, at every service a uh, request touches, you'll be able to find in a trace how that service impacted that particular request, what latency it added, what errors it added, and that could reveal really granular insights. And uh, with this tracing, since you'll be able to find out like uh, is the problem in your system or your dependency, we can say that the final question get answered. And we have added double ticks in the two questions because tracing helps you give more granular data. So all our questions are answered now. We have found out how we can like add observability. So let's just see what the conclusions could be. We need to add monitoring for some important metrics. We need to add logging. We need to add tracing. Looks pretty straightforward on paper. Yeah, so it feels like, yeah, there are three checkpoints. I can just, ha I have a checklist. I can just do these items and my work is done. But when we add these things on production, when we run it for some time, we get a lot of problems and those problems are worth discussing. So let's see what are the pitfalls and how we can overcome them. Okay, expensive logging, case one. So uh, when like your traffic volume increases or you have a lot of services, generally the volume of logs also increases and that could impact like your cost of storage. Generally, uh, like people prefer to add your older logs in cheaper storage mediums for like dealing with expensive logging. And it's working kind of fine for our industry as of now. So I would say that I won't uh, like uh, spend much time on it right now. Second would be expensive tracing, and this is really important. Uh, if you have a lot of uh, users, a lot of incoming traffic, or you have a lot of services, you are going to generate a lot of trace data. And if you are piping these traces to an external provider, then you'll be charged not only for the storage cost, the ingestion cost, but also the network transfer cost, the egress cost. And it could prove to be really, really heavy on your pocket. And we have to do something about it. And the general way to do it is sampling. It's not like a silver bullet, 100% foolproof strategy, but it gives enough breathing room. The first way is to like uh, sample just a percentage of traces. But a much smarter way would be to just sample those traces that have errors of which are slow and sample a few normal traces as well. This is usually called as tail-based sampling. The final pitfall, I feel, is the superficial metrics. So we said that the golden signals can be applied to all sort of uh, application and infrastructure components, and they'll be able to capture certain metrics and uh, give you the indicators about performance. 
but they do they usually like tell us what our users are facing so if you think about it our users usually care about what they are experiencing on your product they don't care about what you are observing in your product and there's a huge gap there and we need to bridge that gap so yeah the metrics superficial metrics is all about that bridging that gap so let's see how we can bridge that gap how we have tried to bridge bridge that gap first thing would be availability so when we talk about availability we are talking about user perceived availability so first point of interest would be are my users able to reach my system it could be possible that within my network i'm able to like uh, reach uh, reach my system and interact with the product but my users are not able to do so so simple ways usually setting up some sort of health checks and we do that external to our ecosystem there are a lot of providers too that help you do this and they could like set up health checks and trigger them from multiple regions all around the globe so with this you would be able to know what users and which regions are able to reach your system or not a second more important point in user perceived availability would be are my users able to do what they want to do so if i'm running a e-commerce service for example a typical user of mine would be like adding a product in their cart doing some sort of payments or just browsing through the stuff and adding stuff in their wish list and or cancelling an order stuff like that so these are the flows that are happening and if we have set up some health check endpoints which are simple just uh, some sort of points which trigger a system send a request and uh, if the system gives an output they're like okay up everything's running everything's perfect if we have those sort of health checks then we may like miss out if there's any problem in these flows and that's not good because if i'm not able to understand what my users are facing then all the monitoring has no purpose so we need to know what our business critical flows are and set up health checks in a way that are transactional uh, e2e health check you can say it kind of traverses your whole flow and then only reports your up and down status so that could be helpful in determining whether your, your users are able to do what they want to do uh in addition to that if you have front end application and you want to kind of measure performance of those applications you could even use something like real user monitoring where you add certain javascript codes in your like front end app and it collects performance metrics for you and uh, the metrics like load time and stuff like that and you would be able to see how your like front end is performing uh, maybe for some particular user set of users or users around the globe so with availability out of the picture let's now move to the performance part where we get to application performance uh, index usually called as aptx so this is like an industry standard that involves finding a score and we usually find a score like in between 0 to 1 the more the score is towards 1 uh, it indicates that your application is performing well let's just look at the formula usually aptx can be like calculated from external providers as well but if you want using this formula you can do that your, uh, yourself too like in your in house solutions so if you consider that uh, your uh, application suppose it responds in t milliseconds in general and uh, your uh, requests are getting uh, like they are getting fulfilled in less than t time or equal to t time then we'll say okay our customer is satisfied if they respond between t and 40 then we'll say okay the customer is tolerating things a bit and if it's greater than 40 yeah the customer is frustrated they are going to going to abandon your product and uh, that's something we don't want and that's that is something we want to measure so here in the formula if you see the denominator is about total request and if you have more frustrating count then that denominator would be higher which would lead to a lower aptx it would move more towards zero which could indicate that your application is not performing well so um, in a way it looks like it works fine but some concerns which are like uh, usually kind of uh, which come up usually in, uh, with people who use aptx are as such we also face these situations firstly uh, 40 could be like a really long time in some cases if you have suppose a website that responds in 5 milliseconds then your user is definitely not going to wait till 20 milliseconds not going to tolerate 20 milliseconds the 40 time they are going to abandon it so this 40 could be really long and the score is just talking about response times and uh, the t value that's like the main thing here if you set it wrong you are going to end up with false results 
and uh, an important thing is that suppose even if I find a proper t value that works fine for me, not all application endpoints in my system would respond within that t. There could be some routes which are slow, and uh, if I like set my t based on those slow routes, then the faster routes, uh, if they are degraded, we won't be able to catch that. So again, false results. That is something we do not want. So. Uh, uh, we tried to like overcome these situations in these like in this way. Firstly, you should consider your error request in the frustrating count, and uh, so that way, uh, like it's not only about response time now. You can like consider errors as well, and um, saturation and traffic they would be covered because if uh, your resources are heavily utilized, the latency is gonna increase, response time is gonna increase. And then you would want to ignore the expected errors. Suppose you are running a login service. Then the 4xx error, the unauthorized error, that's expected. That's going to happen. And you do not want to get alerted on that error rate. So just ignore it out. Of course, you would have to like monitor your application's performance for a certain period of time in production so that you know what normal looks like. You would want to know what a normal uh, threshold of T would be, and you would be able to like find a proper abdic score targeted and find ways to improve it. And you'll have to like fine tune these settings with time. It, yeah, it takes time, but once things are set up, they can actually work for you. And the final thing would be you find your business critical routes, which you're all, which you'll obviously do for the transactional uptime checks, and you uh, monitor these separately with separate abdix t. So like abdix at individual and endpoint level. So th if you, these uh, routes need special attention, that could give you more granular data, and you ignore this out from your entire application. So that way, in case the route is slow, it's not going to affect the whole entire application. So that was about Abdex and how it can be used. Uh, the final thing that I wanted to highlight here was observability-driven development. We talk about test-driven development a lot. That is sort of widely adopted in the industry. But observability usually takes a backseat, and which should not happen. I mean, if a developer is like thinking about end-to-end -end ownership, and uh, if they want that their application should always be uh, up and running and healthy for their users, observability is a necessary part. And for end-to-end -end ownership, this is pretty necessary. For uh, like some external providers, uh, this is sort of like a one-time job. They have their agents, you install them, and they generate all sort of telemetry data. And you can also do this yourselves by uh, configuring tracing via open telemetry. That's also like a one-time job, so it's not much a burden on the developer. It's most of the integrations can be done in one go. And I have a demo to show the same because I wanted to really highlight this. And uh, so I'll be using open telemetry to generate some trace data and send it to a Jaeger backend. So let's just move towards the demo now. So I've prepared like a, a GitHub repo as well. If anyone wants to check that out, check what, uh, like what the code is and how we can integrate tracing there, then this should be a good place. There's a readme as well, which uh, you can use for like setting up that entire chain for a sam sample checking. So let's just try the demo now. OK, so I have three services here, books, orders and customers. And uh, as you see, there's a tracing file in each of these. So I have used simple open telemetry integrations, and these are Node.js services. So I have used auto node instrumentation here for like integrating the tracing part. This is like easily available and uh, pretty uh, uh, like described pretty well in the open telemetry documentation as well. So what we do is we just uh, like what I have done here is uh, I've added auto node instrumentation, and I'm using a MongoDB as well. So I've added instrumentation uh, for that too, so that we are able to capture those spans too. So that uh, could be pretty interesting. And for an exporter, where, uh, where we are going to send this uh, tracing data, we are using Jaeger. So a Jaeger client is like uh, initialized as well. And uh, let's just see. Okay. Uh, so I have three processes running. And if you see, uh, the tracing is initialized for each of these. So, and you need to initialize tracing before you like begin your uh, application code, uh, like run your application code, so that everything is instrumented. And for like the demo purpose, I have used containers, Docker containers. So there's a Jaeger backend running and a MongoDB container running. 
So now I'm going to interact with my application. And for that, I'm using Postman. So I'll be sending some requests to my different services, and I'm going to see how that appears on the Jaeger. So I've already added some books, like for the demo purpose. So yeah, these are working. I have some books. Let's see about customers. Yeah, I have some customers as well. And let's see if there are orders generated. Cool, there are orders as well. So let's see how this appears on Jaeger. I've sent three requests now. And book service, okay, let's just find some traces. Okay, so a few seconds ago, 538, we have certain traces coming in. We, uh, we tried to like uh, request on the get endpoint of books and that is over here and it shows all the spans. It shows that MongoDB was uh, kind of referred to and uh, whatever information about that we require about the span is also here. What time it took is, uh, is also here, like the duration is here, the start time is here. So this gives you like really granular data. Uh, next, let's just try to fetch an order by a certain ID. Cool, so send a request again. And now I'm going to check for the order service. Um, order service. Here's my order service. Find traces. And yeah, uh, this is a few seconds ago, 5.39. And earlier we had like fetched orders by using a get method, so that is also shown. We'll see this particular span. So you can see that the, like a lot of spans are created. Your order service did a MongoDB search. It also contacted two other services for this. It contacted your book service, it contacted your customer service to fetch those details about customers and the books. So that can also be like seen over here. And if you go to these customer services or book services, you'll see that yes, order service had called them. So let's just verify that once. Yeah, it was called by order service and this was like the whole chain. So uh, with this, like with the tracing, we'll able to, we are able to get like more granular data. We are able to see the whole uh, communication structure and uh, at each level, what sort of latency was there, what uh, other metadata is there, we are able to get that from the Jaeger UI. And one thing which I really like in such tools is like the visibility of system architecture. So let me just go to DAC, okay. So I'm able to see the architecture here. My order service is calling my customer service and my book service. And this could be pretty useful when you just want to have a look at your how your entire ecosystem looks like, how the services interact with each other. Uh, some APM monitoring tools even let you like see the DB, like the DB interaction call. I'm not sure if that's possible with Jaeger because I've not tried that out, but it could certainly be possible. And uh, as I mentioned, other providers do have those integrations. And there are some like good uh, initiatives in this area where each service is uh, health and uh, everything like that. If a link is broken or something like that, that would also reflect on your uh, system architecture graph. So yeah, this was like the end of the demo, and we have co we'll come back to our presentation now. Cool. Uh, okay, so here are some references, some really good things that I found out, and you could also go through them. There, this, these are some amazing blogs and videos that you can have a look, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you for your time and if you have any questions, please let me know.